Liquids and gases are what we call phases of matter. Another is the solid phase. Evaporation is the change of phase from liquid to gas that occurs at the surface of the liquid. When water in its gas phase is spread throughout the air, we call it vapor. Water in a dish that evaporates becomes water vapor in the air. Molecules in water move at a wide range of speeds, moving helter-skelter in all directions and bump into one another. A fast-moving molecule at one moment may be the slowest molecule in the next moment. Some gain kinetic energy while others lose kinetic energy. So molecules at the surface that gain kinetic energy by being bumped from below may have enough energy to break free. They leave the surface and escape into the space above to become molecules of water vapor. In this way, the water loses its most energetic molecules, at least at the surface. What does this do to the average kinetic energy of molecules left behind in the water? That's right. The average kinetic energy is lowered. So we find that evaporation is a cooling process. This cooling process is part of nature's thermostat. When our bodies overheat, our sweat glands produce perspiration, which cools us and helps us maintain a stable body temperature. Many animals have very few sweat glands or none at all and must cool themselves by other means. Hence, hot dogs pant and pigs wallow in the mud. The opposite of evaporation is condensation, the change of phase from a gas to a liquid. While evaporation occurs, condensation occurs as well. Vapor molecules near a water surface are attracted to the water. They strike the surface with increased kinetic energy and become part of the water. This warms the water. When you step out of a shower, you're cooled by evaporation of water from your body. But if you remain inside the shower stall, even with the water turned off, the warming effect of condensation counteracts the cooling effect of evaporation. If as much moisture condenses as evaporates, you feel no change in body temperature. If condensation exceeds evaporation, you are then warmed. If evaporation exceeds condensation, you are then cooled. Now you know why you can dry yourself with a towel much more comfortably if you remain in the shower stall. To dry yourself thoroughly, you can finish the job in a less moist area. A dramatic example of warming is the condensation of hot steam, a painful experience if it condenses on you. That's why a steam burn is much more damaging than a burn from boiling water of the same temperature. The internal energy released by condensed steam inside this radiator makes it hot, which spreads heat by convection in the air. Interestingly, radiation isn't the primary way of heating a room with such a radiator. Convection of warmed air is. Time for a concepts check. If the water level in a dish of water remains unchanged from one day to the next, can you conclude that no evaporation has occurred? I'm not asking about net evaporation. If the water level remains the same, yes, we can conclude no net evaporation occurred. If we think about all those water molecules moving helter-skelter, we know there's a lot of activity occurring at the molecular level. Some molecules leave the surface, while others condense on the surface. Both evaporation and condensation occur continuously. The constant water level simply indicates equal rates of both, not that nothing's happening. When as many molecules evaporate as condense, no net evaporation, or net condensation occurs. The two processes cancel each other. It's nice to think small when thinking physics. Condensation occurs in the atmosphere. We experience water vapor in the air as humidity. These friendly molecules illustrate the physics of humidity. Water molecules tend to stick together, but when they collide at high speeds in air, most don't stick together. Like a fast-moving fly hitting flypaper, they bounce away. Whoop, bam, whoom. They remain in the gaseous phase. 
But water molecules moving more slowly than average, like a slow-moving fly hitting flypaper, stick. Whoom, zap, zzzz. In a similar way, slow-moving water molecules are the ones most likely to condense and form droplets of water in the air. Water molecules in air are slowed when they make contact with a cold surface. Now you know why a cold can is wet. And you know why dew forms on morning grass. And you know why the inside of a glass window fogs up when the outside air temperature is lower than the inside temperature. This lets you write on the window. In all these cases, humid air is chilled when it encounters a cold surface. And what happens to water molecules in air when the air is chilled? That's right, they slow down and stick to one another. They condense. So we see why cooler air can hold less water vapor than warmer air. When air cools to the point of condensation, we call it the dew point, which you may hear mentioned in weather reports. Let's talk about clouds. Warm air rises. As it rises, it expands. As it expands, it chills. As the air chills, water vapor molecules in the air stick together. This sticking together is facilitated by tiny particles of dust, salt, and smoke in the air. This condensation develops into clouds. Tiny particles in the atmosphere provide a sort of surface for condensation of water, which you see as jet streams of high-flying aircraft. When such condensation occurs close to the ground, we call it fog. Yum! Clouds in the sky and fog near the ground are the products of condensation. Inhabitants in the International Space Station have a great view of condensation patterns in our atmosphere. I want to leave you with a question. If all molecules in a liquid maintained identical speeds, would evaporation in this liquid be a cooling process? Think about that and defend your answer. Until next time, good energy.